Hi, my name is Chris Hodder. Uh, I am the Public Affairs Manager for the FIM, which is the governing body for motorcycle sport and the global advocate for motorcycling. Uh, and this is my presentation on putting the rider in rider safety. So a little bit about me. Um, I grew up surrounded by motorcycles. My dad's a keen trials rider. I've been riding on the road for about 16 years. Uh, first motorcycle was a Hyacinth GF125, and then I had a Kawasaki and a Yamaha, and now I have the Harley that's in the picture. Uh, I worked for seven years for the British Motorcyclist Federation as their government relations executive. Uh, as part of that, I was involved with the FIM since 2008 when I attended my first meeting in Durban. Uh, after this involvement with the BMF, I went to work as a public affairs consultant for the motorcycle industry. The MCIA, as you might know them. Um, I did that for about six years. And then after a brief period working on something else, I started working for the FIM. The position came up, uh, but I only started in September. So most of this work is actually other people's work that I'm presenting, but please forgive me for that anyway. Brief bit about the FIM itself. It was founded in 1904 to solve a dispute about how international races should be run. And it continued on and off in various forms with the first world championship being run at Wembley in 1936 with Speedway. Over the period it was run by, from 1912 to 1958 by Major Thomas Wynne Loughborough, who was uh, based in the UK and obviously the organization was based in the UK too. But then it moved to Switzerland in Geneva at first. And now it's based in Me, just outside Geneva. In 1994, it became the first sports federation to publish an environmental rule book. And then at the 2000 Olympics in Sydney, it was recognised by the IOC as the sole authority on motorcycle sports. And currently it has 115 national federations as members across all the inhabited continents of Earth. Just in the picture there is 1912, when one of the instances where the organisation was reconstituted. And that's in the centre there with the cane is Sir Arthur Stanley MP. Who, because the, who became the president from 1912 to 1924, as well as being chairman of the Royal Automobile Club and the British Red Cross. Uh, the FIM is split up into two main areas, sport and beyond sport. I've also included a, a notional segment on support because it supports both the sport element and the beyond sport element. But just to break those down a little bit further, so the sport section is has um, commissions on road racing or circuit racing as you might know it, motocross, trial, enduro, cross country rallies, uh, track racing uh, which is more sort of grass track and e-bike which is a new section uh, working on electric mountain bikes and electric bicycles. For the support element it's more um, as an international technical uh, committee, women in motorcycling, uh, international st sustainability, international medical and international judges who obviously judge whether the rules have been broken in any of the sports. And then on the beyond sports side, there's tourism and leisure and there's my section, which is mobility, more on which in the next slide. Now to the history of the CPM as we call it, which is Commission pour la Mobilité. Uh, it was founded as the Consultative Panel for Road Safety in 1988. Uh, it then became the International Panel for Public Affairs and Road Safety in 1993. Then became known as the Commission for Mobility, Transport, Road Safety and Public Policy. Then this was simplified, uh, became the Commission for Public Affairs. And this year, 2021, it's now changed back to the Commission for Mobility. Uh, its focus is obviously on road safety, um, but it also has a global uh, outlook. So we're not simply European or, or UK, <laughs> uh, cover the whole world and therefore we've got members from Colombia, Ukraine, Jordan, USA, Morocco and obviously several European countries. Uh, a lot of our work is actually coordinating that activities across the regions because different regions have their own sort of mirror committees of, of CPM. As in terms of membership we have a medical doctor, a uh, general secretary of a riot club, motorcycle trainers, other professional lobbyists, uh, university researchers, and uh, generally um, we look at the issues across the world and Europe and try and find common approaches. Part of our work is also making recommendations for the FIM Road Safety Award, 
which is then judged by an independent panel. Uh, the UK's Sharp scheme for helmet rating was one of the a recent recipients. Most recent recipient was the motor cap clothing rating system in Australia. And we also hold events. So in 2019, uh, in, in the picture there, there's the FIM annual EU policy debate, which we held in Brussels in September that year. It's probably the last event I think we did. Uh, and there we had a panel of people, including, as you can see in the picture, Matthew Bolton, who's the head of road safety for the European Commission. And we talked about driving licenses. So Riders Helping Riders has been part of motorcycle culture since day one. Early motorcycles were quite unreliable uh, and therefore the bikes used to break down quite often and riders would have to stop and other riders would come and help them out. Um, the reliability of motorcycles was such an issue as it was with cars at the same time that most of the early events were actually reliability trials to see how long your vehicle would last in certain conditions. One of the big events in the early days was the International Six Days Trial. That's the trophy of it in the picture. Um, and then as awarded in 1920, that's now known as the International Six Day Enduro because most motorcycles are, are that reliable that we really have to test them hard now. Uh, one of the earliest motorcycle clubs is the Motorcycle Club, founded in 1903 still runs reliability trials. Rider training um, is a good example of riders helping riders. So most around the, most places around the world, rider training is literally one rider showing another rider or new rider how to ride a motorcycle. It's all peer to peer. Uh, we use the same system in the UK. Um, they use the same system in Colombia and it works very well. SIGS extended in the UK, we have a scheme called Bike Safe, where police riders show riders what they're doing wrong. And that's quite well respected because that's peer-to-peer -peer training again. But police riders are accepted as being very advanced riders and therefore what they say tends to be um, well received by motorcyclists. Also in other parts of the world, uh, deliveries by motorcycles are quite popular. In Brazil, they're known as Moto Boys. Uh, and they form trade unions to show how road conditions should be improved and they have been known to hold protests and, and block up cities simply to improve their own safety. So it's quite a big part of riding culture. As a racing organisation, the FIM is very interested in the safety of the participants in its own sport. So the FIM Racing Homologation Program started out life as the FIM Helmet Certification Program in 2016 with support to helmet manufacturers. This has created race standards of products used in racing. Um, that helmet homologation is now a requirement for all the racing categories we run uh, and it became one in 2019. And it's important to note that racing requirements are not always the same as road requirements. The safety implications are slightly different between the two. But we have used the knowledge that we gained in this area to raise standards for all riders. So, for example, we're working on, with the UN on the UNECE uh, R2206 revision, which covers all the motorcycle helmets in use across the EU and various other countries around the world. Uh, a second stage of homologation is now underway, which is intended to improve the standards of off-road helmets used in the sport. And obviously, that will be of some interest for off-road riders generally. It's probably also worth noting that we're collaborating with the FIA on the requirements for circuits because we share many of those circuits. So we've started working on homologating paints. Uh, we've got two homologated paints there on the slide. Uh, lights, we just homologated the lighting system um, from January this year. And we'll be working on barriers and other things in the future as well. So if you want to know what high quality equipment you should put on the road, the FIA. RHP is probably the best place to look. Technology is obviously a big part of motorcycle sport and the FIM has been at the forefront of pushing for things like traction control, better tyres, better clothing, better suspension and all sorts of more obvious things that make you go faster. But also we worked on stuff um, outside of racing such as pushing for ABS on road bikes across the world. Another area of work we worked on is the Connected Motorcycle Consortium, which is an industry body working to come up with technology standards where cars and motorcycles can communicate with the obvious advantage of things such as in the slide there, motorcycle approach warning, which tells a car 
that might not be able to see that a motorcycle is coming. Uh, we published a standard on that towards the end of last year and uh, it looks like a good technology for the future. Riders training riders is a big part of motorcycle culture and has been since day one so the FIM have obviously been heavily involved in this. As part of this the FIM has run three or four experienced rider training symposiums where rider trainers get together to share best practice across the world. In the picture there you can see King Albert II of the Belgians addressing us at the 1996 edition. We've been involved in EU rider training projects as well so there's been uh, a manual produced for initial rider training. Uh, we've helped consult on that and we also translated it into several major languages including Arabic and Spanish. Uh, recently we've been involved with supporting ASIM's scheme called DVR label which is for post-test training and raising standards in that area for people who already have motorcycle licenses and we've supported them in that by helping some training schools through that process. A new initiative that we've been working on is the International Foundation for Motorcycling which is a charity. It was formally created in December and had its first board meeting in January this year so it's very very new. Its aims are to promote and support internationally the development of motorcycling and the interest of the international motorcycling community, caring for road safety and the mobility programs, education trainings, environmental protection, promotion of women in sporting structures and the social and historical legacy of the FIM motorcycling. So in other words, to grow the non-sport work of the FIM. We've talked a lot about helping riders, but riders are actually the biggest advocates of their own safety. Motorcyclists spend a lot of money on being safe. Um, spend hundreds of pounds on helmets, because helmets can range between 50 to 1,000 pounds. And that's the only compulsory thing. So things like leathers, which can leather jacket can cost between 120 to over a thousand pounds. Trousers and boots and gloves are all voluntary. Uh, new technologies such as ABS, uh, cornering ABS, um, off-road ABS, all that's mostly voluntary as well and quite expensive. Post-test training, a lot of people spend learning on that. That's also voluntary. So overall, motorcyclists spend a lot of their own time and effort into keeping themselves safe. Uh, it isn't always the case, but usually it's the barrier of time and money that, and not necessarily the attitude that is the reason they're not taking an inch, as keen an interest as it would appear. Um, so part of this is also the peer-to-peer -peer relationships. So clubs that motorcyclists form are often spend a lot of their time talking about safety, especially if they're a local club, they'll talk about local road conditions. Um, those clubs are a great way of networking and getting into motorcycling if you need to uh, share a message there. So I would suggest that if you're working in road safety and you want to get the best information to riders and from riders, doing it through clubs is the best way. And that's me done. So if you need to get in contact with me, my email is christopher.odder at fim.ch, fairly straightforward. Or you can post me something if you want to be old fashioned. Thanks for your attention.